Before we continue, I want to take a moment to talk about the sponsor of this video, BetterHelp. Now that we're in the new year, it's always a good time to set goals, especially ones that will help you to work on yourself. For myself, I set a lot of goals I'd like to accomplish in terms of work and the release of content, but I also try to balance that out with mental health goals, like taking time to relax, de-stress, and spend time with friends and family. If these are the types of goals you have for yourself, or perhaps you need help establishing goals in the first place, a therapist can certainly help. That's where BetterHelp comes in. They have really found a way to make therapy easy and much less intimidating. It's quick and simple to sign up, and you'll be able to talk to a therapist via phone, video chat, and even messaging. All you need to do is go to betterhelp.com enigma or click the link in the description to get 10% off your first month. There are over 30,000 therapists in BetterHelp's network, and you can be matched to the one that's right for you based on your needs, preferences, and location. To begin, you'll fill out a questionnaire that will ask you what challenges you're going through and what kind of therapist you'd like. In most cases, you'll be matched with a therapist within 48 hours. Like I said, quick, easy, and efficient. From there, you can schedule your therapy sessions at a time that is convenient for you. And if you feel like your therapist isn't a good fit, you can simply switch therapists with the click of a button in your settings at no additional cost. So join the over 4 million people who have already started using BetterHelp to start living a healthier, happier life. Click the link in the description or go to betterhelp.com enigma in order to get 10% off your first month. Give it a try if you think you could use a little help. Hey there, folks. As you may know, I don't often cover cases that are very recent. Sometimes there is information that is unavailable or perhaps has yet to be known by anyone. But I received a lot of emails about this particular case, no doubt because of the rather disturbing headlines it produced earlier this year. Three fairly mummified bodies found at remote Rocky Mountains campsite. Or, Colorado Hiker finds three mummified bodies in remote campsite. I get it. That is not something you tend to hear every day. The question that usually comes next is something akin to, how could this happen? I can say I was asking myself the very same question as the case unfolded in the media in the months that followed. So for those who have never heard anything about this case, let's go over what the media was saying about it back in July when the story first broke. Initially, all we knew was that a hiker found a mummified body at some remote location in the Colorado Rockies. Then, authorities found two more bodies zipped up in a nearby tent. In fact, they discovered a whole little camp out there with lots of personal belongings and even a lean-to shelter. All of this happened around 350 feet from a location called the Gold Creek Campground in Gunnison County, Colorado, which is also very remote. It's the type of campground that's first come, first served only, and don't expect anything except a piece of dirt and a vault toilet. Towards the end of July, new information would come out revealing the identities of the deceased. There were two adult sisters, 42-year-old Rebecca Vance, 41-year-old Christine Vance, and Rebecca's 14-year-old son, who is not named due to his age. It appears that the family initially lived in Colorado Springs, before deciding to try and live off the grid out in the Gunnison National Forest. According to people close to the family, Rebecca didn't like what she was seeing in society today, especially during and after the pandemic, so she developed a plan to try and live off the land. Initially, her sister Christine was not on board, but she was eventually convinced. The 14-year-old was reportedly excited to be living off-grid with his mom, but at the same time reluctant to be away from the rest of the family and also friends. So their family knew they were going to be living off-grid, though they didn't know exactly where. They obviously must have expected to not hear from them for some time because no family members ever reported them as missing. In September, it was revealed that the cause of death for all three family members was hypothermia and malnutrition. Some outlets even reported that the 14-year-old weighed only 40 pounds at the time of his death. So the deaths were labeled an accident an inexperienced family who decided to live off-grid but were unprepared for the harsh Colorado winter. Still, I can understand why people would have a lot of questions about a case like this. If they drove into the area, why couldn't they just leave once things seemed to go bad? Could they really have been so unprepared as to starve to death just seven miles from the nearest town? While it's certainly not uncommon to hear of the death of an inexperienced hiker or camper who tried to take on a challenge they were grossly unprepared for, 
It's quite a bit rarer to hear of a story like that involving a family of three, especially when it seems like they had multiple ways out of a bad situation if they encountered one. I spent some time looking into this incident, and we are going to go over a much more detailed version of events. We are also going to see the campsite in question, which will give you a much better idea on what the area looked like. Fair warning, this video might be a little more disturbing than the usual because of pictures, video, and descriptions. To begin with, let's go over the sequence of events from the initial reporting to the Gunnison County Sheriff by a hiker who said he came across a body in the woods. On July 9, 2023, the Gunnison County Sheriff's Office received a report from a man hiking in the area of the Gold Creek Campground. The man said he found what he described as an older squatter's camp and that he had observed a severely decomposed mummy laying in the camp. The next day, two members of the sheriff's office set out in the early morning in order to find the location of the reported camp. It didn't take them too long to find what they were looking for. The exact location of the makeshift campsite was 150 yards due east of the Gold Creek campground. This location is across Gold Creek and not far from a road. This is actually one of the seemingly rare instances where we have body cam footage of the discovery. This allows us to experience the scene nearly exactly as deputies did when they first arrived. I don't believe their body cams were on initially because I noticed some key differences between what the officers describe finding in their report and what we see on the video. Still, this is as close as it gets to being there on scene at that time. Again, fair warning, the footage is quite eerie, but I've blurred out any images of human remains, so there is nothing overtly graphic about it. Now that we've seen what the location looked like on the ground, let's go over some of the specifics of what was found. The first thing officers note in their report was a large amount of tissue paper and excrement spread throughout the area. 
and of course the 8x8 foot gray dome tent set up in a small clearing within the pine trees. As they approached, they encountered remains of a human male on the ground about 13 feet from the front of the tent. It appeared to them that the body had been out in the elements for a number of months. The face was black, dried out, and unidentifiable. They note that the body was lightly clothed in a black top and gray sweatshirt, but with no shoes or socks. As they continued their search, they discovered a significant number of clothing items strewn around the area. Trash also littered the campsite in an indiscriminate fashion. The majority of it consisted of old tin cans and packaging for granola bars and ramen soup. The gray tent was closed when they arrived in the area. There were a number of shoes sitting outside of the tent, along with more clothing and assorted packs and bags. A small three-foot shovel and a cooking pot was laying near the tent. Officers then note a large pile of feces located within about 10 feet of the tent and at the base of a pine tree. The body that was discovered outside was on the other side of this same tree. North of the tent area was what officers described as a contained wood structure made of pine poles and sticks which contained additional small packs. Nearby they found a large matted clump of black hair which the officer believed to be human in origin. No explanation for this find has ever been presented, nor can I find anything about the hair being tested. But if the hair was real human hair, perhaps one of the women cut some of their hair off while staying at the location. The officers started searching the assortment of hiking packs and bags looking for some form of identification, but they only found assorted clothing, first aid kits, and personal items including fire starters, sewing kits, survival items, and other things. Another bag contained dry grass and small sticks, presumably for starting fires. After searching all the packs and bags outside, the officers went to the front of the tent and unzipped it to find a second body laying just inside the opening. This body was also lightly clothed with the exception of having no shoes or socks, and was laying on top of a sleeping bag. A third body was noticed laying right next to this one, but it was completely zipped up inside a sleeping bag. In total, they had found three bodies, one male outside on the ground and two females inside the tent. None of the bodies exhibited any outward signs of trauma that the officers could see. They then arranged for a coroner to respond to the scene and remove the bodies from the area. Officers then began searching bags that were inside the tent and found one Colorado driver's license for Christine Vance. They also found a small cylindrical camp stove near the tent entrance. Inside they found burnt organic material. Nearby were several other cans filled with kindling and small wood pieces. Other items found in the tent include water purification equipment, books, and journals. Afterwards, officers returned to the main road and waited for the coroner and a search and rescue team to arrive before moving further. As the coroner and others arrived on scene, the bodies were all placed into bags and removed from the area. There was a continued search of the remaining bags and of the tent for any evidence, but nothing of any significance was found. Afterwards, officers set out trying to determine what event could have led to this grim situation. They knew that a 2006 Hyundai Elantra registered to Rebecca Vance was seen parked in the area by U.S. Forest Service in September of 2022. That same vehicle was towed from the area by Forest Service in November of that same year. The officers noted that a significant number of the clothing items, including undergarments, had been cast aside and appeared to have been soiled with human feces. In addition, they noted that the area in general was strewn with feces. This led officers to consider the fact that all three individuals may have been sick with something like Giardia, an intestinal parasite which can cause diarrhea, abdominal pain, dehydration, and other symptoms. It can spread through contaminated food, water, or even objects. Most commonly, it is transmitted through contaminated drinking water, like from lakes or rivers. Usually, these water sources are contaminated by the feces of animals, or even humans. Hence the alternative name for Giardia, Beaver Fever. The Vance's campsite was close to a number of small ponds and also Gold Creek. They likely would have got some of their water from one of these locations. Officers also considered that perhaps the family died during a time where there was simply too much snow for them to travel any further from the tent. All three were noted to be extremely skinny and likely suffering from malnutrition and starvation from a lack of food. 
While there were a number of food cans found in the vicinity of the camp, there was not enough cans found that would have supported three adults through the winter. Much of their food, like the ramen noodles, also had little nutritional value to support people trying to survive in a winter. The 2022-2023 winter in the area was known to have been quite severe. There was at least several feet of snowfall in the months that they were missing, and several days of below zero temperatures. The fact that the Nylon Dome tent was still standing was an indication that someone may have still been alive for a good portion of the winter in order to continually knock off the snow accumulations to prevent the tent from collapsing. The officers theorized that the male victim located outside the tent may have been the first to pass away, and the other two females removed the body from the tent and placed it outside. In addition, the male decedent was found without shoes or socks on, which supports a theory that he died inside the tent and was later removed. The officers found a number of books among the family's belongings, which covered a wide range of subjects, including gardening, high altitude gardens, edible plants, and a number of seeds, such as carrots and other vegetables. This indicated to authorities that the family was planning to stay in this area for quite some time. The choice of location for their camp also indicated that they had very little practical experience in the area of outdoor survival. The officers note that it was some distance away from a reliable water source, and that the tools they brought were insufficient to maintain any type of lengthy campsite. They also did not see any place where a garden capable of supporting three people would have been possible without a lot of work. One fishing pole was found, which would have been their only source of obtaining animal protein something that would have been impossible to use in the snowy months of the year. Special note was taken of the small wood-burning can about the size and shape of a jet boil cooker found near the head of one of the victims in the tent. The inside of the tent was also covered in black soot, showing that they had been using this can as a stove inside the tent itself, either to keep warm or cook food or both. The possibility that carbon monoxide poisoning may have killed the two in the tent was something that authorities theorized. However, they could not come to a conclusive theory as to what exactly happened at the time because there were so many possibilities. This was an inexperienced family who attempted to survive a Colorado winter in the mountains with insufficient equipment. The chances that they could have ever survived the winter was highly unlikely. On the evening of July 10th, the coroner got in touch with Donald Vance, who was the father of Christine and Rebecca. Donald reportedly told the coroner that he thought both girls lost their jobs during the pandemic and would not put it past them to try and survive on their own out in the wilderness. He also said that he had not spoken to either of them since July of 2022. Donald said that both girls lived together with Rebecca's 14-year-old son and that the three of them were always together and it would be unlikely for anyone else to have been with them. More information on the family was provided after the coroner called Trivala Jara a half-sister to Christine and Rebecca. Travala stated that in the last one to two years, Rebecca had become paranoid of the government and wanted to move off-grid so she began making plans to do just that. It was Travala's understanding that the three family members left Colorado Springs in July of 2022 to embark on their journey to live off the land. She said that Christine did not really want to go, but also did not want Rebecca and her son to go by themselves and apparently started buying into Rebecca's paranoia. Travala was also not made aware as to the exact location the three had planned on going to, and that she was just waiting to hear from them once they got established. She said this was why a missing persons report was never filed with any authority. Later, deputies contacted a woman named Alexandria Kaskowitz on July 12, 2023. Alexandria was another half-sister to Christine and Rebecca, she stated that about one year ago, Christine and Rebecca sold all of their possessions in order to move off-grid. She did not know where they moved to and had not heard from them in over a year. This same day, the coroner was able to positively identify the bodies through dental and fingerprint records. He identified Rebecca as the person closest to the front door of the tent and Christine as the body behind her, zipped up in the sleeping bag. A third body found outside the tent had not yet been positively identified with the coroner planning to use DNA comparison to do so. On August 27, 2023, authorities received a call from a man who stated that he was the father of Rebecca's 14-year-old son. He said he was heartbroken over the news and that approximately one year prior, 
Rebecca had told him that they were going to move to West Virginia to be closer to her father. She also told him that the place they were moving to did not have internet or Wi-Fi. He thought it was odd at the time, and by August of 2022, he stopped hearing from Rebecca altogether. He attempted to call and text, but never received a response. He said that Rebecca's phone was disconnected in December of 2022, and after that, he had no way of getting in touch with her. He eventually heard from other family members that Rebecca had gone to live off-grid, but no one in the family knew where that was. Ever since he heard of the finding of the remains in the Gunnison area, he had been racking his brain as to why they would choose Gunnison in the first place. To him, it made no sense due to its harsh winter environment, and he's not wrong. If any planning went into this off-grid excursion, and it sounds like there was, you would think that the family had some idea of the winter weather conditions of the place they had planned to live. The next day, on August 28th, the coroner released the autopsy results for Christine, Rebecca, and Rebecca's son. All three reports indicated that the cause of death was malnutrition and hypothermia, with the manner of death being an accident. Let's take a moment to go over the autopsies. Some rather ignorant news sources reported that Rebecca's son weighed only 40 pounds at the time of his death, which is absolutely ridiculous. I don't know who they got writing these things. The mummified body that was found weighed that much, which is to say the body that had almost all of its water removed weighed 40 pounds. I'll briefly remind you that the body is mostly made up of water, so a mummified body weighing 40 pounds isn't necessarily bizarre. It is certain that all three family members were starving and malnourished when they died, however. The 14-year-old's body was so dry that no tests could be done for toxicology or carbon monoxide poisoning. He was wearing multiple layers of clothing at the time of death, as well as a rosary around his neck. Nothing abnormal was found during the autopsy. Christine's autopsy showed that she was also very thin, but still had enough fluid in her body to perform toxicology tests. All of them came back negative, and she also had a normal carbon monoxide saturation in her blood. She weighed 96 pounds at the time of discovery. She was also clad in multiple layers of thin clothing and wore a rosary around her neck. She had some slight abrasions to her head and torso, but nothing that wouldn't seem to come from spending many months working and living off-grid. Rebecca's autopsy was very similar, negative findings on toxicology and carbon monoxide poisoning, multiple layers of cloth, and a wooden cross around her neck. She weighed about 100 pounds at the time of her finding. She also had multiple small abrasions, but nothing serious. So, overall, Nothing seriously unusual in all of the autopsy findings. I'll also take this moment to remind folks that finding a cause of death in these situations is often based on the circumstances surrounding them. Like with hypothermia, when someone freezes to death, there is typically very little physical evidence at autopsy. Therefore, it is a determination usually made by the exclusion of other evidentiary factors, but also with consideration to the circumstances surrounding the death. That's why the exact wording of the cause of death here is the cause of death is best attributed to malnutrition and hypothermia. Because what do we know? Well, they were incredibly thin and starving, and it was also brutally cold while they were in the area. There are no other obvious causes of death written on the body, so the determination is made for what is most likely given the circumstances. In this case, we know they're thin and they endured a harsh winter so the cause of death is most likely malnutrition and hypothermia. Having gone over this case in significant detail, we can see a little more clearly how things happened. It appears the family left for the mountains sometime in July of 2022. They took their 2006 Hyundai Elantra and parked somewhere nearby, likely the Gold Creek Campground. Their car would be towed in November, over two months into their stay, and right around the time weather really starts to turn bad. It's hard to say what their plan was for the vehicle. Perhaps they thought that this location was so deep in the mountains that the Forest Service wouldn't tow it. I have to assume the family did not intend or believe that their car would get towed because it was their only way out of the area in the case of emergencies or if they needed supplies or if they wanted to contact their families. In simplest terms, their car getting towed was likely a death sentence for this family. I would imagine there came a point during their stay where they tried to leave by going back to their vehicle, only to find it gone. 
Cell phones would likely have been useless as most parts of this area are a complete dead zone with the occasional area of poor coverage. I did not read anything about authorities finding any cell phones belonging to the family, which does seem a bit odd. Maybe they simply weren't mentioned, but it would have been interesting to see what their call history was, or if they attempted to contact authorities at all. It's difficult to be too critical of the family's decisions without knowing what exactly their plan was. Sure, we have second-hand information that they wanted to just ride off into the wilderness and live off-grid, but for all we know, their initial plan could have been to spend the rest of summer and part of fall living and working at that location and then leaving for the winter, only to find that their car was towed. We don't know exactly how much food they brought, but it was obviously not enough to last for the winter, and authorities said as much. So either they greatly misjudged how much food they would be needing to survive, or they did not plan to stay for the winter, but instead were forced into it. It doesn't make much sense for them to even desire to stay the winter there, as they did not have a good shelter built, and the three of them staying in a tent all day doesn't seem desirable. So the question remains, did they really want to try and survive the winter there, or were they simply forced into it by the removal of their vehicle? I suppose an argument could be made for either, or even a combination of the two. There is plenty of evidence showing that this family was woefully unprepared and inexperienced. It might not be so surprising if they did think that they could survive the winter. In this situation, they really should have left a note on their car. I'm sure they didn't want the Forest Service knowing that they wanted to live out there, but still, you could leave a note on the car saying you're camping in the area. If I was in that situation, I would have been checking on the vehicle daily because it wasn't far from the camp. It really could be that they thought this spot was so remote that the Forest Service wouldn't mess with their car. This is just one assumption of many that the family seems to have made and later paid a heavy toll for. They should have told friends and family their location in case something went wrong. They should have given a time frame to family members in terms of how long they would go without contact. Something like, we'll check in every two weeks and if we don't, contact authorities. None of these things were done, and as a consequence, this family was never even considered missing. One other thing I want to mention are the reports that the family got this idea for living off-grid by watching a lot of YouTube videos. There are, of course, a lot of videos on YouTube about outdoor survival and bushcraft. Many of them are quite good and provide a lot of information, but many videos that show an individual building an off-grid cabin somewhere in the deep woods can be seriously deceiving. Obviously, these types of videos are usually heavily edited for time. Sometimes they even have help hidden off-screen. Oftentimes they make the process look smooth or maybe even easy. Mistakes or hardships can often be edited out if they don't fit in with the general feel the creator is trying to present. The ultimate fact is, we are typically only viewing the smallest fraction of the actual process it takes to set up and build an off-grid cabin or camp. This, in turn, can deceive some people into thinking these things are easier than they really are. I've been guilty of similar things in the past. Early on, when I did some of my on-scene investigations, I would just appear at the desired location through the magic of editing, not showing the long process it took to actually travel and hike there. Now, obviously, I can't show the full hike because that would be boring, but nowadays, I think it's important to at least partially show the hiking and hardships involved in getting to locations. If you watch my Charles McCuller video, I failed to even get to where I wanted to go. It wasn't the first and won't be the last time that kind of thing happens, but I think it's still important to include it because it shows that things aren't always as easy as they appear. Things don't always go according to plan. Sometimes it involves a lot of suffering, so people should take that into account before attempting something similar on their own. Was the Vance family probably misinformed on the ease of living off-grid? It certainly seems so. Did mental illness play a part in Rebecca Vance's desire to leave society? Possibly. In reality, things like this happen more often than you might think. Somebody gets the idea to try and live off-grid or attempt bushcraft on their own. They might be inexperienced and in for a hard lesson. Other times, the lesson can be far more severe. The Vance family was likely ill-prepared to take on this challenge at every level. But whatever their plan was, their route of escape, their only salvation was taken away when their vehicle got towed. The sad part is, they probably died slowly, over a period of time. 
They likely got too weak to do much of anything, especially if they got sick from contaminated water to top it all off. In analyzing this case, I'm not trying to place blame, especially not on people who are not here to defend themselves, but this is certainly a case to learn from. If you have an interest in outdoor survival, bushcraft, or living off-grid, then ease into that lifestyle. It's not necessary to dive into the deep end right off the bat. More than anything, always have multiple contingencies in case of emergency. It would have been smart to prepare for an eventuality where the car would no longer work, or even if it got towed. Having an emergency transponder would be essential in doing what the Vances were attempting. It's also necessary to let people know where you are, and to have set check-in times with family members. These types of incidents are rare, but no less tragic. They are also avoidable. Hopefully, cases like this stand as a lesson for people in the future who are interested in moving their life off the grid. And until next time, thanks for watching.